founder of GNU Citizen. I don't need to. I need. Yeah. Let's introduce him properly. Which uh, will uh, um, tell us uh, about a brief history of JavaScript uh, uh, security arsenal. Go ahead. Can you switch on the microphone, his microphone? Test? Okay. Is it working now? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, actually, I can't see anybody. It's just this light is it's too bright for me. Um, well, first of all, before, I, uh, before starting the, the actual talk, uh, I want to start with this. Uh, and basically, this is a collection of old movie posters. All of them are horror movies. And uh, since you already know what the talk is going to be about, is uh, you know that it's going to be about JavaScript, you might actually be thinking, well, they maybe relate somehow to the fact that JavaScript is a horrible language. And uh, that's why I put all this stuff. Well, although this is true, uh, this talk is not about how horrible it is and uh, all the security stories and uh, concerns around JavaScript. We all love uh, fear mongering. It is actually about that all these uh, movies start with the credits first. And it's going to be very unwise uh, for me if I start this talk without giving the proper credits to everybody who deserves that. Unfortunately, uh, when we talk about history, I need to give credits to a whole lot of people which I can't include in a single slide. Therefore, I use this clever machinery called MD5 to hash some stuff and put that as credits. Um, and this basically includes all kinds of people which I work with and uh, which contributed to this great field of technology and security. Now, since this is a history talk, and there will be some demos, so it's not going to be that boring, um, we need to start with, first of all, uh, going through some of the main enhancements in the web application security space and web, web, web applications in general. So first of all, uh, in the 90s, we start from there because this is when, this is the age of the main, like most of the innovation that we still use today. We've got actually three main browsers. Uh, some, who actually recognized the first one? So some, somebody, how many actually of you recognize the first browser, the first, the first icon, right? A few, a few of you. So basically, this is the very first web browser. It's called Mosaic. And then later in that decade, we have Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator. And Netscape Navigator is actually based on Mosaic as a browser. But during this era, era of the 90s, we have the main really innovation uh, in terms of browser technology. We have two competing browsers, Internet Explorer and Netscape. And they pretty much develop most of the technologies that we use today. Now, whether this is good or bad, a lot of people speculate about this. Uh, you can't really tell. Uh, but this is the time when JavaScript was invented. This is the time when uh, session management was invented, cookies, uh, st storage, the HTTP uh, stack uh, pretty much matured to the state where it's actually usable, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of actually innovation. Now, if we compare the, these technologies uh, of the 90s with the web technologies of today, it's actually a very different picture because instead of having just two competing browsers which innovate, we actually have five different browsers, and they're all competing with each other. Uh, we don't have only uh, one specifications. We actually reach HTML5 as a specification. JavaScript actually has matured quite a bit, and now we're actually iterating like version, I don't know what. Uh, we actually had to step back a few versions even uh, because of some design uh, decisions. We actually have represented this from a mobile, um, uh, mobile web space uh, by the two main operating systems, Android and, uh, and iOS. We've got client-side and server-side technologies, uh, uh, rich internet applications, uh, the server stack represented by all kinds of databases, Oracle, whatever, and MySQL, and also NoSQL databases, which actually start to appear right now. Uh, representatives of the Model View controller, and Java, and whatnot, and of course, Angry Birds, because it's everywhere. Now, uh, as you can see, this is pretty much adds to uh, a lot of noise uh, in terms of uh, applications, uh, application security, and just where applications all together. There is actually too many decisions to take. And actually, this is enhanced by the fact that it's not just about the technology that we put on the server and the client. It's also about the technology that actually links all these things together. And this is pretty much the fabrics of the web. I mean, pretty much, there are services right there uh, uh, now uh, out there that uh, without which we cannot go any further. And they're just basically so integrated into the the, your daily lives and, and the fabrics of the internet, we, we can't just remove it. It just becomes part of it. 
and it's going to be part of it pretty much forever, uh, as long as we use this type of technologies. But also, uh, because of all of this, um, the web in general uh, has matured from the simple stack of, uh, of, of, of the technology provided by two main browsers to a whole industry of, um, of, uh, of technology, which actually is pretty serious about uh, the stuff that they develop. Uh, on today, you can actually, you know, today maybe someone is creating a service which actually will be evaluated at billions of dollars in the very near future. So it is important. It is important also in terms of security, and that's why security actually, in a bit, has become a little bit of a fashion. So this is actually my own uh, awesome Photoshop skills. Uh, as you can see, I've actually created a cover uh, of a fashion magazine to show how um, sellable uh, it will be if we actually start talking about security in, in the fashion world. Because fashion and security are quite similar in some way. Everything new uh, becomes old, and everything old becomes new again. So while today we are looking at the mobile security space, uh, and it's a very hot topic, it's going to fade away in the next five, six years, maybe, maybe even longer. Who knows what, how you know, um, uh, deep uh, that um, period will be. Are we going to go back examining the same stuff we were talking about today or even five years ago? Um, a very good picture to illustrate what is happening in the web uh, application security space is the top web hacking techniques, which uh, Jeremiah Grossman was actually responsible kind of uh, putting together, but is actually the work of uh, everybody uh, during the, the last uh, five years, five, six years. And uh, I believe it started from 2007. I'm, I can't find any other reference, but uh, there are actually about 50, 60, even 70 odd issues every year, which are aggregated into a collection. And out of this collection, we actually, uh, the community picks top 10, which are the most interesting or the most, uh, has the most impact. So I'm not going to go through all of them individually one by one, but it is actually a very interesting list because uh, when you go through some of this stuff, you will find that. Not all of the issues uh, on that list are actually resolved, and we're actually researching for new vulnerabilities and we're exploring new things while actually still lagging behind with old stuff that has been reported and hasn't been fixed yet. So I'm going to quickly go through some of them. Like 2007, we've got a bunch of them. Uh, I guess the most, most, my favorite is anti-DNS spinning and uh, the Gmail hijacking technique. Uh, 2008 Gifars, uh, uh, some kind of, all kinds of stuff. Uh, click jacking actually appeared at that time, 2009. Uh, we've got even more issues. Um, HPP, which HTTP parameter pollution, which is actually something that even today, actually it's a, it's a big concern, but hasn't been explored much. Uh, 2010. Uh, ever cookie uh, and all kinds of stuff. 2011, we've got more issues. And of course, because we are now in 2012, I can't actually give you the full list because I don't think it's actually ready yet. Is it? Oh. No, it's not. So at the end of the year, we're going to have a new list. But what is peculiar about this list is that uh, we've got this, some, this type of a graph. Now, this is actually a pretty sim small sample from 2007 to 2011. But peculiarly enough, uh, it almost seems that it's going to drop. Now, this is actually a huge speculation in the number of vulnerabilities that has been actually accounted for, right? N number of attacking techniques actually accounted for. Uh, so my speculation that is going to go even further down. And I think the reason for this, there might be two reasons. The first reason is maybe web security has uh, matured enough, so we actually fixed all the issues, and uh, this is a good sign. It's going down. Or maybe the second, second reason is perhaps because uh, this is serious business, just like the internet. And uh, web, web vulnerabilities these days actually cost a lot of money. So if you find a generic way to exploit some class of issues, you might actually not be so keen to share this with the whole world because out of this uh, technique, you can potentially find uh, a lot of um, exploits for that will be worth for a bounty program. That will actually net you like you know 500 here, 500 there, maybe even a couple of thousand. Uh, in different places, and uh, therefore make a lot of money. But if we, if we actually skip this for now um, as a speculation, obviously for everybody, this is a, a no-brainer that the e-commerce is actually not safe in a web browser. Uh, it's been actually repeated over and over again on all kinds of slides. Now, since this is a talk about JavaScript, let's talk about JavaScript. Well, 
not actually AJAX, but just the JavaScript the way it is. And when you actually talk about JavaScript, a lot of people associate JavaScript attacks with one attack only, and that is the attack of cross-site scripting, which is actually a trivial attack. Uh, you basically uh, find a injection flow in a website or something else. You send it to a victim via some kind of a phishing campaign or something else, or just fool the victim to click on something, and it gets executed, you steal the session. A lot of people actually associate with the exercise attack with the alert one attack, which is a pretty good name for it because it is actually quite simplistic. But what is really, really good about the alert one attack is that although it's so simplistic, that's actually what's cool about it because it's so simple, but at the same time, it's so devastating if it's actually used in the right hands, in the right technique. And if you look at some of the major outbreaks of this type of vulnerability from 2005 to 2012, we've got actually different kinds of outbreaks of worms, which are actually quite, uh, although pretty simple, uh, not, you know, it doesn't take actually a genius to read the code and understand what it does, or even actually create one, uh, they are pretty successful with the way they actually exploited all these social networks uh, on which they were spreading. Uh, you also have uh, exercise vulnerabilities which actually not only exploit websites, but actually exploit your client. Because as it turns out, web technologies are very reusable. You know, people use them for all kinds of stuff. Like for example, instant messaging clients. You know, I mean, instead of actually rendering all these smiley faces and things like that in some kind of a uh, custom rendering engine, why not use uh, an HTML renderer, you know, which is a web browser. So any vulnerability within this HTML renderer will potentially have a huge impact on the application. And that was the case with the Yahoo Instant Messaging uh, XSS issue, which was actually pretty cool. Uh, we've got also pretty much Twitter. Uh, we've got Apache actually being compromised by an XSS issue, which is pretty interesting. Actually, it was an XSS issue in the Jira uh, application they were using. Um, somebody actually fooled an administrator to visit the page which was already infected, steal the session management, the session, uh, session tokens from the user, you know, log in as that user and propagate further. It actually started with a simple XSS attack. Uh, we also have Obama XSS, and actually this is quite interesting because uh, in 2011 there was um, an entry, I forgot from whom, so I'm sorry I'm not I'm crediting that person specifically, but it was an entry about uh, how someone could have won the pawn to own contest, which uh, I think somebody actually netted uh, $60,000 this morning uh, with a simple exercise issue, right? Somebody actually found a way to exploit, uh, to actually take an exercise issue to compromise an entire device. And um, in 2012, you actually got more like Gmail stored XSS and stuff like this. Now, this is just basically an illustration that although XSS issues are pretty simple, uh, they're actually quite prolific with the impact. Uh, not everywhere, uh, because uh, what is peculiar about them, they're simple to find, simple to exploit, very hard to come up with a, with a good strategy to uh, abuse them, right, and use them in the right way. This is actually where actually this uh, additional knowledge is required. Now, for this talk, uh, when we talk about XSS, we also talk about what can we do with it. And one thing is, uh, for example, we can potentially steal the session uh, management, we could actually uh, create forums, we could do all kinds of stuff. But the inspiration for this talk in particular came from uh, three main sources, and I'll start with them uh, one by one. The first source was uh, Jigto. Uh, how many of you have heard of Jigto? No? No one? Just one person. I'm pretty sure two. I'm not counting Jeremiah. So uh, that's uh, not Jigto. That's not <laughs> this guy's nickname is not Jigto. <laughs> Uh, although that would be a pretty cool name, nickname. Uh, that's uh, Billy Hoffman, and he came up with something called uh, Jigto, which comes from Nikto, but written in JavaScript. And it was actually a very, very basic tool, which uh, works in the exact same way as the, as the uh, Nikto uh, scanner, but actually is only using client-side technologies. And it works by, uh, for example, a victim arrives on, a, on a, some kind of a compromised page, and then you can launch other attacks against other servers pretty simple, so use them as a proxy. The second inspiration uh, for uh, this presentation uh, came from this Samsung fella, uh, and it's actually a tool called Attack API, which uh, I developed. Um, An Attack API is basically a collection of different techniques which we can use 
uh, after exploiting cross-site scripting vulnerability. So for example, not only we can just hijack the session, right? In some cases, we might actually not be able to do that, depending on, uh, for example, what restrictions we have on the session management. But maybe we can, we can encapsulate the user within the same boundaries of the currently exploited session. So even though they actually navigate, they try to navigate away from the current page, they actually stay in the page. So if they're actually within the same domain, we can simulate some kind of AJAX behavior within the application. So the page itself does not refresh, and everything they do will be monitored. Uh, so you can come up with all kinds of other techniques like key logging or whatever, you know, whatever they do on the page can be re potentially recorded and, uh, and of course uh, replayed or do whatever. And the last uh, inspiration for this was the MySpace worm for this particular presentation. And the MySpace worm, uh, for those of you who know it, is basic, for those of you who don't know this, is basically um, um, a cross scripting worm which actually hit uh, the internet in, uh, well, MySpace network in 2005 and uh, basically showed the world that it's actually quite simple to take this type of vulnerability and uh, make them actually quite, quite, uh, quite uh, evil in some ways. Uh, what was actually cooler than the MySpace worm was the uh, Facebook worm which actually hit Facebook after MySpace. And uh, instead of, uh, do you actually know what's the result of this worm? What exactly it did? You guys know what exactly the MySpace worm did on the MySpace network, apart from actually propagating across all the profiles? It was actually quite simple. It was, it was making uh, this guy, Sammy, um, who wrote it. Uh, uh, he, was making, he was adding himself to the friends list, I believe. And then he, you, know, you could actually make him uh, a hero or something like this. Uh, I don't use MySpace, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, essentially, at some point, I believe he had actually more friends than the guy who made MySpace, like Tom. Um, so that was pretty cool. But actually what was cooler, that after this MySpace worm, there was another worm on Facebook, which actually converted all the Facebook pages into MySpace pages, which was <laughs> even better, you know, because actually they were restyled as MySpace pages. Now from these uh, three inspirations, uh, I kind of, uh, over the years, I came up with uh, three evil plans. And uh, they illustrate different methods of attack using client-side technologies and primarily using JavaScript itself. Now, the first evil plan was to use the victim browser to attack other web targets. It's a pretty simple technology. We've got the attacker, the attacker attacks the victim some way, and then the victim is used as a proxy to attack other, other targets, other nodes on uh, maybe the same network or maybe on other networks. Uh, a good illustration of this type of attack is, uh, is the JICTO, as I talked earlier, right? It's only one. The second evil plan, which is basically evil plan 02, is to use the victim's browser to compromise the local network. So not actually attacking other targets, such as web, web targets, like a traditional web scanner of some sort, but actually attacking other network resources within the network where the victim is. Now, this is actually my favorite one. I mean, this is where I spend most of the time uh, researching things. And from this evil plan, uh, there were a bunch of attacks which were designed over the years. And I don't think it's actually as explored as it should be. Uh, so there is actually there is a further um, room for improvement. From, from here, actually, we start with some very basic stuff, such as uh, there was a port scanner. You could actually write port scanner at some point. I'm not quite sure if it's still possible. You could actually write something that will allow you to brute force, uh, for example, credentials, uh, basic, well, the basic authentication credentials that you may store uh, within the browser. Uh, and my favorite actually is attacking UPnP, which um, I'm not sure how many of you heard of UPnP before. Anyone? So UPnP is, uh, stands for Universal Plug and Play, and actually it's a technology which is uh, basically everywhere. You, you've got it. If you have a home router, you've got it. It's running there. Uh, and the purpose of UPnP is for devices to talk to each other, but uh, with using some sort of a common protocol. And in fact, the common protocol is a stack of, of uh, five different uh, technologies, starting with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, technology based on uh, uh, multicasting, multicast networks and uh, ending with uh, a SOAP, SOAP, basically SOAP messages over HTTP, over TCP, or HTTP via UDP. Most commonly, they use HTTP via TCP. 
So it's a very, very simple protocol. You send a web request to a server and you can actually make that server do stuff. Uh, usually UPnP is used for uh, such as when you actually need to use BitTorrent or you use, need to use, uh, I'm not sure if Skype does this, but maybe it does. But anything that requires for the program to have a publicly facing port. Now nobody will ask you to go and actually open ports manually on your router because not, not most people wouldn't be able to do that, to do port forwarding on the router. So they actually use UPnP to do this stuff for you. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something transparent, which actually happens underneath the open torrent. For example, BitTorrent, BitTorrent will open, for example, some ports uh, on your router, so actually traffic can be forwarded from the external facing side to the internal because the whole network is actually netted. Uh, and therefore, there's no, there's no direct connection. Uh, it turns out that uh, you could actually forge uh, a UPnP uh, request to most routers and you can actually make them do some crazy things, such as you can basically say, I want to change the credentials of the router. So reset the admin credentials from whatever they were to whatever you actually choose to be, right? And you actually don't need any authentication to do that because UPnP by design does not require authentication because at the end of the day, you have actually two technologies talking to each other, right? Uh, two two uh, different devices talking to each other. They actually don't know about anything about authentication. Uh, the other thing you could do is uh, expose the router on the external facing side. So actually the administrative port will be actually externally enabled. So once someone changes your credentials, they'll be, also, uh, be able also to log in into your router. And depending on your router capabilities, they might be able to do other things. But also, you could change the DNS settings of the router, which is actually the most horrible thing because this is almost like a persistent backdoor. Nobody has ever invented, nobody yet has invented something like antivirus for firewalls, uh, sorry, for uh, routers. Right? Nobody actually has this, such a thing, you know? So if somebody comp compromises your router, you're pretty much, it's, it's game over. You know, you don't know. You don't know how it works, and there's no trace of it, unless actually uh, you spot it by when somebody's actually, uh, you know, uh, messing around with your DNS traffic. You might be able to spot it then, but actually it's completely invisible. Um, forget about, okay, so let's move on. There we have the CSRF. Uh, authentication, on, again, on routers, attacking Linksys cameras, like the other IP cameras. In fact, they're actually all vulnerable to all kinds of uh, attacks over the network using the browser itself. So you can actually take a simple session of a user who already has a Linksys camera or something like this, an IP camera inside the network. And because all of this talk uh, HTTP, uh, you can actually compromise all these devices and uh, attacking other embedded devices. It turns out that a lot of embedded devices, they actually have uh, embedded HTTP servers. Uh, and this is a good reason why you have this, because um, uh, instead, of, instead of the vendor providing you with the software to, uh, to mess around with the device, you just basically need to visit the web page. It's just, it's much simpler. Unfortunately, these web pages are very, very insecure. And the Evo Plan 03, which is basically using the social networking um, uh, mechanics of a, of a social network or uh, other system which actually integrates like this mechanics into itself uh, to, uh, you know, if you infect a victim or if you are a part of the social network, you can infect yourself and then spread an attack across all the nodes of that network. Now, just because this has been proven to work for social networks like Facebook and MySpace, uh, it does not necessarily mean that these are the only targets. In fact, there are a lot more targets than this. And actually, you know, Facebook and, and Google Plus and all these uh, social networks, uh, they're not the only one that actually have this sort of networking capabilities. And pretty much any large enterprise has some kind of a software that is pretty networked, uh, such as uh, maybe you've seen uh, as, uh, SAP systems or, uh, or some of the Oracle on demand systems. They are very actually uh, social oriented. So any type of attack that applies for uh, a social network will work really, really well there. And in fact, even on network devices, they will work also because you can, um, uh, such as for example, if you have a cluster of, uh, of uh, IP cameras with, uh, with web capabilities, that could also be potentially used as some kind of a social, sort of a social networking worm because they're all linked with, to each other. So the results of Evo Plan 03 is that yes, we can and we've proven that uh, over time, every single social network has been compromised uh, at some point uh, by social networking worm, and in the future, there will be even more of this, I imagine. But these days, actually, these big guys, they're paying money, so they're kind of, in a way, in, uh, in a good hands. So not that many people are willing just to disclose the vulnerability, they can just get paid for it. But there is also this, the bonus evil plan, 
which is essentially use the victim's browser to compromise the system itself. And actually, this bonus evil plan actually came from a talk that I had, uh, a discussion that I had uh, with someone who works for an um, uh, antivirus vendor. So we were talking about uh, uh, malware heuristics, because this is basically uh, uh, the technology that we are betting on that will actually do a better detection of malware in the future. And uh, the way malware heuristics works is, uh, is you know, in a very simple words, it's, it's a, it's a score, scorecard, basically. So if you, if you take a piece of uh, malware, the more malicious things it does, the higher score it will get. And based on that score, uh, we can determine whether it's malicious or not. It turns out that only works, this thing works only for a, on a process by process basis. And sometimes the antivirus does not have any idea about the whole system altogether. So if we take, let's say, a malware attack and we break it down to smaller attacks executing from different origins of an operating system, such as, for example, maybe a malware, there is one component which is looking very malware-ish, let's say it does, I don't know, DLL injection into Internet Explorer or something like this, which could be potentially to say, okay, that's malicious, although a lot of uh, normal software does that sort of stuff, uh, especially HP. Uh, software. Uh, maybe at that point, actually, a JavaScript is executed from Internet Explorer to actually perform the second stage of a, something, like an infection or something else. By actually breaking the attack into smaller components, uh, it becomes very, very difficult to do heuristics because uh, together, all of these uh, components uh, of the operating system will score very little, but all, when you combine them together, they'll actually reach a very high score, which is definitely seems to be some kind of a, a malware activity but actually very, very difficult to detect. For that, actually you need a system which monitors everything and keeps uh, a history of every single event uh, on your computer. And as you can imagine, this will become very, very slow unless, unless we, uh, uh, maybe in a couple of years' time when the Moore law reaches the stage where we can run uh, whatever virtualization we want and it's not gonna take any, any, uh, any time, then at that point this technology will become more uh, sensible. So here's some examples of this bonus evil plan attacking browsers, the browser Chrome, uh, embedding, for example, uh, malicious uh, extensions into, into, the, into uh, modern browsers or embedding some kind of other um, extension component. Uh, you'll be surprised how many applications actually use JavaScript for things uh, and you never heard of before. Like, it's not just the browser itself, it's also, um, PDF readers, it's also like instant messaging clients, it's also stuff like Photoshop itself, actually you can script it with JavaScript. Uh, uh, there are actually all kinds of things that these days execute JavaScript. And the reason for this, especially on Windows, is because Windows comes with one component which is actually a key to all of this and it's called JScript. And JScript is very, very similar to JavaScript. It's almost identical with some kind of a semantic differences in some areas, but typically you can write JavaScript code and it will execute the same way as a JScript code. And JScript, essentially via the W scripting host, uh, the Windows scripting host, uh, you can actually do anything on the system. So Windows, for example, exports uh, primitives such as like .gs files are actually executable. .hta files, HTML applications are also executable. HTML applications are effectively HTML pages, but instead of saying .html, they just say .hta. It's a, it's a very simple. The only problem is that HTA executes with a, very, with a lot more privileges than HTML applications. HTA application can actually do whatever on the system, and, uh, and so on. So talking about tools, uh, when I started this uh, journey researching some of these uh, client-side issues, um, uh, I was thinking at that time about tools, but actually the browser technology was not mature enough to allow you to write a very, very uh, interesting tools. And um, uh, in fact, today, for client-side exploitation, uh, there are um, a couple of tools uh, which I want to mention. The first one is called Beef, which is probably uh, um, the best representative of uh, what a client-side uh, exploitation toolkit should look like. But to me, it's like a over over uh, engineered in some ways. So Beef is a simple framework which allows you to kind of take advantage of XSS issues. The problem with this is because it almost acts the same way as Metasploit. You kind of create sessions uh, to, um, to, for example, let's say you, you find an XSS attack and then you, you know, you, the victim visits that page. At that time, you might be able to execute some stuff, right? Uh, Beef allows you to actually set this stuff. Um, so, so it's actually quite easy to come up with some kind of a generic attack or something like this. Uh, and it has like an interactive 
sort of session system where you can uh, keep exploiting the same user if he actually comes to a different page and stuff like this. But uh, generally, it's um, I don't know I don't find it that easy to work with. Of course, we've got Metasploit, which is uh, has a, a you know a lot a whole range of client side exploits, but all of these exploits are actually browser bugs. So they're actually proper bugs. We actually you can get some kind of remote code execution on the browser. Now I'm not saying they're bad. Uh, I mean, in fact, they are awesome, you know. Uh, I mean, this exploit will actually take you a lot further than any of the stuff that I was talking about earlier. But then what if the system is, is pretty secure, right? What if you have something like a Google Chrome web browser, which is actually a pretty decent web browser, right? And browsers actually catch him up to become better uh, in some respect. And there is also this tool, such as like uh, uh, SET, which is the... Um, Social Engineering Toolkit, some other tools which are kind of a very, very similar, uh, XSF, uh, XSSA, Westploit, and so on and so forth. And they are essentially what is known as a XSS attack proxies. But I've got an another idea. And the idea is actually to use the web browser itself and the capabilities that provide a web browser uh, to do security testing for offensive and defensive purposes. Now, I've outgrown a little bit the offensive side of things, so I'm actually not <laughs> thinking in terms more of defensing. But it turns out that all of these browsers actually have enough technology packed into itself to be able to create a very, very advanced applications, uh, which will allow you to do things uh, not possible uh, a couple of years ago. There is also another thing which I wanted to do is to actually put uh, a complete uh, toolkit of security tools without actually rooting uh, the box uh, on a Google Chrome Notebook. And as you, some of you may know, Google Chrome Notebook uh, runs just the Chrome web browser. Well, it has an operating system underneath. It's Linux, so you can actually modify it if you, um, it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. But it's actually designed to run as just a, a web browser, right? So what if we want to integrate like a proper security arsenal of tools uh, which not only attack web applications but also any kind of application. So imagine like your entire framework of tools, uh, including Metasploit, running from a web browser interpreted by JavaScript technology by using some of these evil plants or evil vectors that we, uh, we discussed earlier. So I came up with uh, this sort of a concept, uh, which is uh, it took actually five, uh, four years to develop. Uh, and basically, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a set of, uh, of a different technologies, which when you combine them, uh, you, get, um, you get like a very, very advanced toolkit. And uh, this is pretty much the evolution of this technology. Uh, it started something with the, the JavaScript port scanner, which is a very, very simple tool. Uh, allows you just to find ports uh, on, a, on, a, on a box by using just JavaScript technology. Uh, then he moved on to attack API, which, as I explained, was just a collection of different uh, techniques. Uh, you can use post cross scripting exploitation. We've got something called now the suite, which is basically a set of tools uh, only concentrating on web application security, uh, but they allow you to do all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, we're moving towards something called um, another technology, which uh, is a partly open source. Uh, it's called weaponry, which is basically uh, all the security tools that you know today, we can actually put them and we can execute them with, uh, with, very, with a high degree of certainty that will work uh, in, in a, a web browser. So basically, you will never need or have, uh, have the need to actually run anything else but just to visit the website, which allows you to actually execute all of these tools. So uh, in another way, what we want to do is basically uh, from uh, uh, monkeys to have some kind of a uh, uh, nuclear explosion and reach the stage where we are some kind of a uh, mutant thing. So at this stage, uh, we've got uh, basically working a security scanner and client-side some client-side security tools, which I'll demonstrate. I'll show you how they work. Uh, but before I move on to this, um, I want to talk about a bit of the architecture and some of the challenges of actually creating such a system. Now, the first thing about JavaScript is that it's actually pretty bad language. So everybody who actually decides to write something that is fairly complex, such as maybe a security scanner or uh, some kind of a, a generic security tool, uh, you will find very, very quickly that the language itself, uh, although it allows you to do a lot of things, is actually pretty poor. Uh, because uh, we're talking about 
a problem with a lot of complexities and, uh, and you end up with bugs which you've never anticipated to have. So in order to tackle this, um, well, first of all, that's why JavaScript is actually called the, well, the, the assembly language of the web because it is flexible but also allows you to actually screw up pretty badly. Uh, also in the security circles is also known as the shellcode of the web, you know, because uh, a lot of these web attacks these days are based on injecting some kind of a JavaScript in some page. Now in order to tackle this problem of uh, JavaScript being pretty bad, uh, we've got, we had to develop a, a better architecture of actually uh, running whatever we want and you're running it within the browser. So we needed to create some kind of a compiler essentially. So the current stack technology starts with the code, where the code is written in some kind of a generic language, um, which is very, very similar to the C type of languages. It gets through a compiler, and the compiler will guess the language and spit out JavaScript code. And in fact, it can actually spit out also Objective-C code and some other types of stuff like, like, uh, like uh, Python and Ruby, for example. And then, obviously, that code then will execute on the target. So, the good thing about this thing is that instead of being dependent on like one single language like Ruby and then porting, for example, Ruby to some kind of embedded system, which is actually a very big challenge because Ruby itself is a very general purpose language and may include a lot of general purpose primitives. Instead of doing that, you got, you got a very generic type of a language and then you have a compiler that actually compiles it down to the target. So if you decide, for example, I want to put this toolkit on something like, uh, I don't know, embedded system of some sort, you know, and needs to be compiled in a certain way with certain libraries and things like that. You can actually do with this without actually going through the pain of actually porting something like a common runtime, like Ruby, for example, or Python, or something like this. Uh, but the challenge is that also, uh, in order to do some of the things uh, within the browser, uh, you've got also security controls, which are actually applied by the browser itself. So some of these contr security controls are the same origin policies. So unless we reach the stage where the browser itself, and we may actually reach this stage, uh, where, for example, an application wants to gain a certain sort of access to other websites, so to be able to send uh, cross-origin requests and stuff like this, such as, I think there is at the moment some kind of a standard that is similar to this. Uh, maybe it's called web intents and something like this. Maybe that will be the, the answer to this. But essentially, we need to be able to do requests, and we want to do all kinds of other things cross origin, like between different origins, between different sites. Uh, unless we have this, we still need to rely on browser plugins. But the browser plugin itself is actually quite small shell, which just allows certain capability to happen. So you need to, in order to execute this like a very complex piece of code, which is compiled and put on the client, you still need some kind of a support these days. But it turns out that over time, I think this support will disappear and you no longer will need uh, this uh, browser uh, extension to help you with this. So now talking about this, uh, I want to show you uh, a set of uh, sort of uh, different kind of examples uh, just to illustrate what is actually possible today with uh, just a generic compiler to JavaScript and an engine written entirely in this uh, custom language that is compiled to JavaScript. So basically, this is the set of uh, tools. Uh, I want to I wanna show you some of them. Now, the first one, which is actually my favorite, which uh, uh, it was uh, created quite recently, is basically to simulate something similar to a, a, a web proxy, what a web proxy will do. But in fact, without actually having a proxy installed. So what this tool does is basically capturing just traffic, and it's just displaying it to the user. Right? So now we've got this tool running. Uh, in one frame, right? And if I open another one, I'm just typing some stuff. I don't know. What you see that on this side of the window, we actually can see uh, what is actually happening on the other tabs uh, of the same of the uh, of the same browser, without actually the need to uh, to, uh, to run a proxy. Now these are actually all the requests which are actually captured by when I was typing Google. And uh, 
in order to execute this, in, uh, actually in order to do this, uh, it, is, it is kind of a based on two things. First of all, it's most of the code is actually, um, it's, uh, it's basically JavaScript. Um. Oops, what is this? So most of it is actually compiled to JavaScript. It's actually, as you can see, it's a huge piece of code. It's like a lot of stuff going on. And then we have like a very, very lightweight extension which uh, enables uh, the collection of, uh, for example, uh, just the requests themselves. Right? Now, what we also can do with this uh, type of tools is to run a full scanner, for example, to actually scan for vulnerabilities. Now this is actually going into this uh, Jigto area where we actually run a scan against the system, right? Now obviously this is done for pen testing purposes, but nothing stops from an attacker to actually do something similar within a browser. So for example, if I just start a scan, it will start identifying issues and all the stuff are actually executing within the browser itself. So the browser is actually fast enough to detect, uh, for example, uh, all kinds of interesting vulnerabilities, including stuff like SQL injection, including stuff like local file includes, which are pretty, pretty uh, devastating attacks. Uh, and they can all be executed by just uh, some JavaScript on the web page. Cross site scripting. And in fact, it's actually quite accurate in that respect. What you also can do, since we can actually manipulate requests and things like that, we can actually also uh, mess around with these requests. So for example, if I want to just basically mess around with this, I can just basically get it and execute it. And pretty much everybody who has any, any uh, experience with uh, an attack proxy like Zap or, uh, or Burp, uh, you, you will be familiar with that type of interface. So we can actually take a request, we can modify it, we can send it to the server, we get response back and then we can do all kinds of things. The only, pro the only advantage here is that while these proxies um, are pretty cool, I mean, they are very generic because you not only you can capture the traffic from web browsers, you can also capture the traffic from other applications. Uh, although they're pretty cool, they actually lack the context of each request. They don't know, for example, why a certain request happened and where it actually origina originated from. It just knows that there is a request from the browser and it just proxies the request and you lose all this metadata which is associated with the request, such as you don't know if this is, unless you're expecting the headers, you might actually not know that this is XML HTTP request. You may, uh, for example, see some kind of a web socket, but you actually wouldn't know what is this for. Uh, and most of the proxies wouldn't be able to tell what is a web socket. Uh, in this case, because we are running within the browser, we actually have all this metadata in front of us already. So we know why each request happened, we know where it came from, and why it happened. Uh, did it happen because the user pressed the button? Did it happen because uh, maybe there is a web socket? Is it part of a game or something? So it actually has a lot of metadata which actually can help us during a pen test. And uh, last but not least, I want to show you, uh, for example, that we can uh, even hunt down for, actually this is not the last example, this is another one. We can actually hunt down for uh, individual issues. So for example, if you're looking for one specific vulnerability on a website or, or as part of some kind of application, we can actually execute very, very fast tests. Like, and there you go, you know. It doesn't take longer than, you know, most of the time, for example, if you want to use this type of attack, whether it's a client side by actually compromising via XSS or something like this, uh, or maybe as a part of a pen test, it doesn't take longer than a couple of seconds to actually be able to figure out if something is vulnerable or not. Um, such as, for example, this, which is a pretty cool example. Uh, if I take, Now this is actually more advanced example and it's just a demo. Uh, if we take, uh, uh, 
this uh, type of application. And if I scan it very quickly, I'll be able to tell that there is actually a vulnerability on that application. And with one single click of a button, we can actually have something similar to what Metasploit has, right? Which is an interactive shell. So basically, all happens within the browser itself. Uh, not, only, not only we can just uh, look for vulnerabilities, but we can also uh, actively exploit them and take advantage of them. And in fact, it's actually quite possible to take uh, a tool like Metasploit and, uh, and port it. I mean, you, you wouldn't be able to take Metasploit itself because it's written in Ruby unless you write some kind of a Ruby virtual machine in JavaScript, which is actually possible, but it would be really, really slow. Uh, but uh, it is actually possible to rewrite some of the core principles of Metasploit and actually create them and execute them from this type of environment. And so this is um, that's a huge advantage, you know, not only uh, in terms of, um, let's say, if you look at it from an exploitation point of view, but also from pen testing point of view, it's actually quite, quite a big deal. Some other stuff that we can do, uh, basically, we can have uh, more advanced type of, uh, well, actually, forget about this one. Uh, we can actually have uh, more advanced types of uh, um, uh, uh, exploits that actually rely only on, on client-side technology. So for example, this is, this is just a simple example of how we can uh, take something like uh, an excess issue and we can convert it to something more powerful. So instead of just uh, collecting session identifiers and things like that, we can potentially execute all kinds of interactive attacks uh, with, with that XSS issue. Now, the way this thing works, it just starts with injecting some kind of a, a payload, which needs to be injected into the victim session. So in this case, I can take, uh, I'll just I'll open it at the top because it's just simpler. But uh, I'm not going to use a real vulnerability. I'll just inject it straight into Google. But let's say this uh, vulnerability was injected by XSS or maybe stored XSS on a social network by some kind of a uh, stored vulnerability. But at this stage, you got the similar sort of mechanism uh, which Beep has, uh, but slightly more advanced in some ways because uh, from here, we have actually the typical sort of shell environment where we can have all kinds of tools. So if we do something like, uh, for example, it's a sim now here it's like uh, nothing is happening, but if I say this, deface, and it just, uh, you can basically inject uh, other foreign code into that uh, other application. Uh, the good thing is that we also can inject whatever we want because we have interactive uh, sort of, uh, even syntax highlighting editor. So if you want to do something like, you know, whatever, and just say, push that, and you got it like uh, uh, running. So we can actually develop all kinds of stuff uh, and actually send them to this uh, distinct foreign sessions. Now, obviously, now this is quite simple. But if we combine this stuff with the power of all the other tools which I showed you, uh, which we can now, now we can design a very, very complex types of attacks. Uh, and sometimes, in some cases, this type of attacks actually don't require this type of special relationship between the browser and extension in order to work. Sometimes it's just possible to do them blindly, uh, which is that, that's why uh, there is another tool here which actually allow you to compose uh, request forgeries. But the, the, the interesting thing about this tool is that it will be able to create all kinds of variants of cross-site request forgeries. So for example, if you want to upload a file, there is not really a direct way of doing that in, uh, in by using forms because the user has to go and click on a file. So we need to actually construct the file in memory, sort of, so to speak, right? Uh, you might be able to do that with XML HTTP requests, but they also same origin policies which apply to this. Uh, but as a solution, you can also construct this stuff uh, as, as forms. So for example, this tool uh, can actually take any of those requests and convert them to the proper browser control, which you can actually use to deliver those type of attacks to a victim, 
So for example, if you're attacking, let's say, a home router, uh, and you want to actually send a specific type of request to that home router to work, you need to encode uh, your request also pretty much like a form, and then submit the request as a form, because otherwise it won't work. No, you can't use like XML HTTP requests and stuff like this. So this tool is basically a demonstration that that is uh, absolutely possible. And uh, I'm not sure if I have anything else to show, but uh, this this one is essentially showing you how you can just take uh, like. Uh, um, a lot of uh, complex type of payloads and maybe encode them, decode them, stuff like this. It's basically like the same stuff you might see in Burp or uh, Zap Proxy, but the difference is that instead of having uh, a list of uh, commands that you can execute on a payload, you actually have a whole uh, programming environment uh, which is um, a lot more powerful because uh, we can do all kinds of crazy things. You know, and we can just go on and create all kinds of crazy payloads. You can create like JSON payloads, which encode it, and with a, with an attack vector inside, and then encapsulate it in Base64 encrypted or whatever. Uh, the whole scenario of how you want to do this uh, can be just recreated, and then you can just execute it every time you need something like this. So really, the point of this is that uh, the JavaScript itself. Uh, not only, it's not a toy language. I mean, it is pretty stupid language with a lot of stupid bugs uh, and stupid things that it does, but actually it's not a toy language. And you can take it and you can create very, very advanced tools. Uh, not only uh, that affect or can be used to, to pen test uh, vulner uh, for web vulnerabilities, but also can do all kinds of other stuff, uh, networking as well. Um, just to finish the slides, um, uh, I just need to send some credits to people who actually helped me out with uh, some of the collecting some of the research which I presented earlier and also some of the pictures which I included on those slides and of course uh, in 2008 uh, after a conference in Poland we started uh, um, uh, me and some of some people from my group we started doing something called human exploits uh, which is uh, pictures from people uh, from the conference and I'll just show you this pen testing in action. And uh, with that, I want to wrap the presentation and ask for questions, if anyone has any. Questions? I think it, this looks very cool. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, some of the interaction requires a plugin, but then you demonstrated an extension. Are there the the distinction being extensions are normally JavaScript that runs in the browser? Um, is there actually th parts of this that require a plugin on the order of like a Flash or a Java? Mm -hmm. Well, we can. Uh, the thing is that this is a very very thin layer. Just provide, just exposes some capabilities. It turns out that, for example, what Flash can do, uh, JavaScript may not be able to do, and vice versa. Uh, you also have the same thing with Java as well, and other client-side technologies. And as I said before, uh, in some cases, for example, you might have a target that allows you to do cross-origin requests. By definition, you know, maybe it has a cross-domain XML file, which is actually with a wide open domain uh, specifications, which is not actually unlikely to happen. Uh, you might have other things, you know, that help you out. Uh, and, but this is actually a very, very thin layer, which we can very quickly create uh, these helper utilities, which are very few, by the way, just like uh, 100 lines of code, right, that will be able to take uh, any generic type of request and translate it to whatever medium you want to be translated to. Now, in, in this case, because uh, most of these tools are designed for pen testing, uh, I made a simple browser extensions, which is actually written in JavaScript uh, itself. Uh, and it's so simple, I'm not sure if I'll be able to show you. Uh, let me see. It's actually ridiculously simple.
Okay, that's not a good. Uh, It's actually not not very difficult extension to write, you know. It's uh, a few lines of code, and it's actually very well uh, structured code, you know. So it just provides you some helper uh, methods, and m in fact, it just provides only one, just to allow you to do cross-domain requests. That's all. Uh, but you can do you can do whatever really. Um, also, talking about the the malware as part of a, of a, a delivery system, that can be also used. Uh, imagine. I don't know if that's going to be a sensible approach uh, to actually have a malware which actually drops stuff into your Firefox uh, or Flash to actually be weakened itself, mm -hmm. you know, so it can allow other tools to execute within that environment without actually being detected as being malicious because it's a trusted component. Next uh, question. Uh, um, yeah, so I was wondering how would like uh, an initial user's browser be compromised? So, for example, with Beef, they just need to run the Beef hook and they're hooked, and then you can send them JavaScript. Um, I was just wondering, because you, you kept talking about the extension, would the user need to install the extension? The extension is only uh, designed to uh, some of the tools. So for example, the scanner itself, if I run it from my own machine, uh, you wouldn't be able to scan all types of websites. The reason being is because it comes from a web page, and that web page has security policies applied to it, right? So you wouldn't be able to execute. So that's why you need this helper extension to be able to do that. Now, if you're talking about in terms of a, an actual attack that you want to construct attacking someone, then uh, you can take the same framework to construct the attack. So it can be as complex as it can get, right? So if you think about something like uh, a multi-stage type of attack, right, where you actually want to compromise a server via some kind of a, a vulnerability, uh, like even buffer overflow and install something else on the top of this, and you, you actually have this sort of a staging environment. You don't need to go and launch Metasploit and actually create all this like network stuff, you know, to be able to work. You can just execute the whole thing from a web browser, and all we need is just a delivery mechanism to send the request from point A to point B. Now, if there are any controls that uh, this allow you to do that, such as the same origin policies, you can still do it blindly via form or something like this, you know, which is known as, as a CSRF attack. So I'm not sure if this answers your question. Um, uh, almost. I think it was more, um, so if I'm, I'm, if I'm, a v I'm a user who's been targeted, mm -hmm. um, how would you compromise my browser? As I said, with Beef, it's a matter of just me running the Beef hook, running like that one line of JavaScript. I'm, I'm compromised. How would you compromise the user? Does a user just need to run a piece of your JavaScript or do they need to actually install one of your extensions? Or uh, Compromising your browser will be will be kind of uh, related to some kind of a browser vulnerability, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, if, if somebody wants to compromise your browser or they're capable of compromising your browser, that's a whole new different story. You don't need to go to this extent uh, of doing things. Now, if you want to use the browser, it, your browser itself, to compromise, let's say, your network, right, uh, then in that case, no one needs to compromise your browser. They can just skip this stage, you know. It's actually a lot of hard work, you know, to actually compromise your browser these days. Uh, well, if you're doing all the things right, I'm not saying that, you know, a uh, browser is really safe. It's not. But, you know, for someone who is educated, they can actually make a very good decisions and, you know, keep their browsers relatively safe. Uh, but if somebody wants to take uh, the opportunity of you visiting a website or being exploited by XSS issue and take this thing further to actually compromise you in a very, very weird ways, let's say, for example, your router, they might actually want to compromise this because you would never know. Uh, then that's certainly possible without actually compromising your browser. And uh, as I said, this type of attack, uh, which could be very simple, you can actually make it very complex and very uh, elaborate, uh, almost to the extent you see with typical malware spreading. You know, so you can make it like very, very cool type of attack. Okay, thank you. More questions? Well, then, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Petko.